everyone and welcome to the video for chapter 5, which is all about flight instruments. So I'm going to start out by talking about your six pack, your six basic instruments. So all pilots have a six pack, well, unless they're flying glass, then maybe they don't. Uh, but we have a couple of instruments that are connected to our pitot-static system. And that includes the altimeter, the airspeed, and the vertical speed indicator. So let's start with the altimeter. The altimeter is connected to your static, as is the vertical speed indicator. So this goes to my static port. There's a connection to the static port as well for the airspeed. But basically this is how the altimeter works. You have inside of it, you have these little bellows. And the static pressure is connected into these bellows. So your static kind of comes into that. And the pressure changes as you go up and down, right? As you go up, the pressure becomes less because there's less air on top of you, pushing down on you, if you will. So when the pressure becomes less, this thing will contract. These little bellows will contract. Now this is hooked up to a set of gears and those gears will turn the little needle on the altimeter. Now the altimeter reads kind of like a clock you know, you have the big hand and you have the little hand. So if I had something like this, this would indicate 3,100 feet. So little hand is thousands and the big hand is hundreds, right? So that's how it reads. Of course, if you want to go over 10,000 feet, there's another little pointer and there's a couple of different styles for that and your book has those pictures as well. The important thing to know about the altimeter is that you have a setting knob because you have an altimeter setting, and this is set in the Colesman window. So what is that setting? That setting is the local barometric pressure for your airport if that airport was at sea level. So as the pressure goes up and down, you have to change that in your window. How do you set that correctly? Well, if you're taking off from a little airport that doesn't have a weather reporting system, you set it to the field elevation before you take off and you call that good enough. So that's an altimeter. You can also set it based on the altimeter setting if you have a weather reporting system uh, and that's how that works. All right, so we're talking about altimeters. Let's talk about different kinds of altitudes. We have indicated, and that is pretty much what your altimeter says when you set things correctly in the Colesman window. And then we have pressure altitude. Pressure altitude is what you get when you set your altimeter to 29.92 inches of mercury by the standard pressure. So it is indicated altitude corrected to standard pressure. And then we have this guy, density altitude. And this is altitude, pressure altitude, corrected for temp. 
Standard temperature is 59 Fahrenheit or 15 Celsius. And density altitude, I like to say this is wind chill for planes. What does that mean? If you have really you know, light air, you have non-dense air, your density altitude is going to be higher. It's like you're at a higher altitude. So what makes high density altitude? High elevations. Hot temperatures. When the air is hotter, those molecules are banging around more, they're less dense, there's less air. Also humidity. The more humidity you put in the air, the less air or oxygen is available for burning fuel and stuff. So density altitude you can think of as wind chill for your plane or other aircraft in general, really. So when the density altitude goes up, that means the air is less dense, less air for your engine to produce power, less air to produce lift. And if you look at performance charts, some of them will say, here's the performance at this altitude, this pressure altitude and this temperature, and here's an adjustment if the temperature is different. And others will say, calculate this density altitude and look that up on the chart. So that's two different ways of calculating performance. So indicated what's on the gauge pressure, what's on the gauge when you set it to 29.92 inches of mercury, standard pressure. Density altitude is that pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. And that is like wind chill for your aircraft. All right, so let's talk about airspeed. So your airspeed is connected to your static port and it's also connected to the pitot. That ram air pressure. So what operates this gauge? This gauge is operated off of the difference in those two pressures. And it's really that simple. So the pitot is only connected to the airspeed and that's it. And, you know, it reads a pressure difference. Now, what about different kinds of air speeds that you might have? On the gauge, you're going to have different ranges, different arcs. So you have the white arc, and this is the flap arc. So the bottom speed on the white arc is where it's going to stall with the flaps out approximately. And the top speed on the white arc is the maximum speed that you can install or deploy flaps. That's called VFE, flaps extension speed. Then we have the green arc. This is your normal range. The bottom speed on the green arc is the speed where the plane's going to stall with the flaps up. And that's usually called VS or VS1. This flaps down stall speed is VSO. Stall speed with stuff out as Rod likes to say. And here you have, at the bottom you have VS1, and at the top you have VNO, normal operations, also called a structural cruising speed. Then we have the yellow arc. Yellow means caution. So don't be there in other than smooth air. And the top of the yellow arc is the red line. That is V and E. Never exceed. So never be that fast. You might damage the plane. You might literally rip the wings off or at least damage something. So speaking of damaging stuff, 
there is one speed that is not on the gauge, and that is VA. VA is the maneuvering speed. What does that mean? That's the speed at which you can apply full and abrupt control movements and the plane will stall before it will break, before you cause any damage. Now this speed depends on the weight and that's why it's not on the gauge. So this speed is going to go up when the weight goes up. When we talked about lift, we said the lift was proportional to your speed squared and your stall speed is actually proportional to the square root of your weight. So if I have a very small airplane, this is not going to vary as much as if I have, let's say, a six seat Piper and it's just me in there the maneuvering speed will be a lot lower than if I have full fuel and five other people. So that's maneuvering speed. Some other air speeds that we care about, we have VX. This is the best angle of climb speed. And VY, the best rate of climb speed. So normally, this is going to be higher than Vx, and we talked about this before. We said as you go up, these two speeds actually converge together to where you get to your maximum altitude. So normally, like let's say you're flying our little trainer, you'll be flying at 76 miles per hour. That's your Vy. Vx is more like 60 miles per hour if you have 10 degrees of flaps out at least. So those are some different air speeds that you need to know about. Now while we're talking about air speeds, another thing you need to know is the difference between indicated air speed, calibrated air speed, and true air speed. So indicated air speed is just what it sounds like. It's what the gauge indicates. Calibrated air speed is that speed corrected for instrumentation and installation errors. You know, ideally, our pitot tubes would be 20 feet in front of the aircraft, but that's bad because people would impale themselves on the thing while they were doing their pre-flights, and it would be hard to make something that large and have it structurally sound. So we have errors from that, errors from the installation. Um, if you look in your manual, there'll be a chart that'll show you what's the calibrated airspeed for different situations. So we always have indicated air speeds in the charts, not calibrated air speed. Then we have our true air speed. As we go up, the air gets thinner. So we're actually going faster than what the gauge indicates. So some airspeed indicators will have a little calculator, basically, where they'll say, all right, here's a little knob. Get your current temperature and pressure altitude and align the pressure and the temperature and the top of the gauge. And then down in the cruise range, it'll tell you what your true airspeed is instead of indicated airspeed. You probably won't find that on some of your slower trainers, but if you fly faster aircraft, you tend to see that more often. So that is true airspeed. Why do we use indicated airspeed? Because Indicated airspeed is a nice indicator of lift. The air gets thinner, so I don't care if I'm going faster. I care that I'm producing a certain amount of lift. And because of the fact that indicated airspeed, or technically calibrated airspeed, shows you how much lift you're getting, that is why we talk about indicated airspeed. And we say it stalls at this indicated speed, approximately, and it's about the same. Right? You know, things like putting out the flaps also affect the airspeed and doesn't read exactly correctly. Okay.
last static instrument is the VSI, vertical speed indicator. Now, how does that work? That is connected. It's kind of like your altimeter and that you have this little bellows and now you have a calibrated leak. that is used to connect this to the static. So the pressure inside here changes at a rate that depends on the difference between the pressure in here and the pressure outside of it. So outside, you've got, in the instrument, you've got your pressure. You've got your static pressure, basically. And so it says, oh, okay, this is changing rapidly. So this is going to expand and contract. And again, there's some gears and that drives a little needle. And it says plus 500 feet per minute, minus 500 feet per minute. Things to know about the VSI, it takes a little while for it to be accurate. You have to be in a steady state climb. You know, you can just pull the nose up real quick and go, look, I'm climbing over a thousand foot per minute. Uh, not really. That's not a sustained climb, certainly. So VSI only reads accurately if you're in a sustained or steady state climb or descent or level. Other things about the static system, many aircraft have an alternate static system so that if that static port got clogged, you have a way of driving these three instruments still. Some planes don't have that. If you look at our old trainer, it doesn't have an alternate static. So what do you do? By the way, alternate static's usually vented into the cockpit. It's not gonna be as accurate as a proper static port. That's something a lot of kit manufacturers used to do before everyone had GPS. They would say, hey, our aircraft will cruise at this speed. Well, they didn't have a proper static port. They had the static just vented to the cockpit, which tends to be lower pressure than outside. So that pressure difference was higher, airspeed read too high. But now people have things like GPS, and they're like, no, your plane doesn't really fly as fast as you said it would. So if you don't have alternate static, what do you do if it gets plugged? You bash in the face of your VSI. You sacrifice this instrument so that you have working static. Why this instrument? You didn't really need it, number one. Uh, number two, it's the cheapest one. It's probably the easiest one to replace, too, because it's further down in the panel. So, you know, you're looking at a couple hundred bucks for this guy. Altimeters are more expensive. Airspeed's definitely more expensive, especially if you have the specialized one for your airplane, which you probably do because of all those colored arcs and things. So that is all about our pedostatic instruments. And then now we'll discuss gyroscopic instruments. So let's talk about gyroscopic instruments, starting with the additive indicator or AI. So this typically looks like a little miniature airplane. It's using an adjustment knob at the bottom so you can move this up and down. And then you'll have a blue part and a brown or black part that represent the sky. And then there'll be various marks for zero degrees, 10, 20, 30 degrees, and then 60 and 90 degrees of bank. So this shows you which way is up, 
and how much you're banking. So this is a very useful instrument if you ever find yourself in the clouds or low visibility. You know, even if you're flying at night in EFR, sometimes it's hard to see the horizon. So it's nice to have a gyroscopic instrument like an attitude indicator to help you out. Now, talk, couple, talking about gyros. A gyro is basically a spinning top. So how do you spin that top? There's two basic ways. You can either use vacuum, where you suck on some fan blades essentially and it causes it to spin. You can also use pressure, by the way, which is something you might find in larger aircraft. If you're flying something like a King Air or you know, some of the larger twins or even the small twins, some of them will use pressure instead of suction. Either way it works. Or you could have an electric motor that spins that top. So most aircraft that you're going to fly, you're going to have a vacuum driven attitude indicator and a vacuum driven directional gyro and an electric driven turn coordinator. And the reasoning behind that is if you lose your vacuum system, then you still have one gyro. Or if you lose your electric, you still have two gyros. You don't want them all in the same system. So, you know, that's how they work. They're just spinning tops. And if you look in your book, you're going to see better pictures for that. Now, Rod talks about how do you get power, if you will, for these gyros, the, the ones that are vacuum driven. Well, you get power from them using normally a vacuum pump. Now, some aircraft actually will have two vacuum pumps because these vacuum pumps are known to fail every you know, thousand to two thousand hours or so. If you're lucky, right? If you're not lucky, they fail a lot quicker than that. So it's an engine driven pump that actually has a shearable shaft. So if the thing gets locked up, it will shear off the shaft so that you know it's not bogging down your engine, but it's suddenly not producing vacuum. Some aircraft will have two of these pumps, just in case. Uh, I've also seen some aircraft which will have a backup electric vacuum pump. And I've seen other crazy systems where if the engine driven pump fails, there is something that's not technically a vacuum pump, but they have a, a setup where it produces a little bit of vacuum enough to run at least one gyro. I had a friend that built an aircraft and he had a vacuum pump and then he had a little pop-up Venturi as an emergency vacuum system. So speaking of Venturi's, this is something you might find, say, on the club's trainer. Instead of having a vacuum pump, if you look on the right side of the fuselage, you're going to see two little horns that look kind of like this. Why is there two of them? Because there is. I don't know exactly how they're plumbed. I haven't actually looked into it to say, is this, you know, one per gyro or is this just in parallel in case one of these doesn't work, but the air comes in this way, there's a restriction, you get low pressure here and it's tapped in the middle where you get the low pressure. So that produces a suction. So what do you need to know about these? Well, these are a lot more reliable than a vacuum pump. However, it takes a while for these to work. And if you're not going quickly through the air, you're not drawing a lot of air through this, they won't work. So if you look at our trainer, when it's at idle, there's no vacuum. When you're taxiing around, there's no vacuum. When you do your run up, you'll get a little vacuum, maybe be two inches of vacuum but you really want more like five. So don't be surprised if you're flying an aircraft that has this sort of a system when you're taking off and initially flying for the first five to 10 minutes, if that attitude indicator is not exactly upright just yet, it might take a little bit of time. Other weird things you can have happen occasionally. I was flying in an aircraft last week 
where the attitude indicator was kind of on its side and it stayed that way for the whole flight. And I thought, well, that's really odd. And I think what happened was from the time they started up the engines and they were idle till they took off, that time was too short. And so the gyro never really got upright, never got fully uprighted. And uh, the next flight, it was, it was fine. So just little strange things that you had need to worry about. Okay, other gyros, we said that the directional gyro is typically driven by vacuum. And why do we have the directional gyro? You know, Rod talks about magnetic compasses. He talks about compass errors. We have our turning errors. We have our dip errors because that magnetic field doesn't go exactly parallel to their surface. And there are a couple of easy ways to remember how to deal with these errors. One of them is ANDs. If I accelerate, I turn toward the north. At least my compass says I am. If I decelerate, my compass indicates a turn to the south. The other one is if I turn, it will lead and lag on my magnetic compass. So for these reasons, I like a DG. Now DG, you have to set to the compass initially, and then you have to check it every 20, 30 minutes and possibly reset it. You know, if it starts drifting to where you have to reset it more than every 20 minutes, like except in the case of something like our trainer where you're doing a lot of landings and you have low vacuum situation, um, then you should probably look at replacing it. Okay, so the other one is UNOS or OSUN, depending on your preference. Undershoot North, Overshoot South. So ANS applies to going East and West, you accelerate, decelerate you'll indicate a turn. If you're going north or south, you need to under or overshoot. How much? Well, it depends on exactly where you are, but generally speaking, I will make a little chart. It looks kind of like this. I'm gonna undershoot north, overshoot toward the south. If I'm going north and south, I overshoot or undershoot by nothing. If I'm going east or west, it's going to be 30 degrees. And, you know, I guess it depends on which way you want to put this diagram. But So I'm going to undershoot, overshoot by 30, 20, 10, nothing. 10, 20, and the same thing on my southerly headings. So this little diagram has helped me out a lot when I was flying IFR, but don't worry about this. This is, you know, when you start flying IFR on instruments, uh, you'll worry about this kind of stuff a lot more. And I'm not going to put all these headings on here, but you get the general idea. So that's a DG. It's very convenient to have. Uh, also, if you have a compass, there's two basic styles of compasses. There's a whiskey compass where it rotates. The disadvantage of a whiskey compass, number one, if you look up at the compass, and the heading you want is to your left, you actually have to turn right to get there. Sometimes that's a little confusing at first. The other thing is in turbulence, the thing can wiggle around a lot. And thirdly, the thing can leak. So we had our trainer, the magnetic compass leaked and all the white kerosene came out of it. It's not actually whiskey, so don't, 
don't try to drink it. It'd be very bad for you. Um, so the kerosene all leaked out, made a huge mess on top of you know the radios and everything else in the aircraft. And we replaced it with a vertical card compass, which looks kind of like a DG, but it still has those same turning errors. So don't think that just because it looks like a DG, it acts like a DG, because it doesn't. It's still gonna have those turning errors that we just talked about. Okay, last instrument in your six pack is the turn coordinator. The top part of the turn coordinator has this little miniature airplane. And we have these little lines. And those lines indicate if we're making a standard rate turn. A standard rate turn will take two minutes to go all the way around. So you'll see two minutes. Sometimes on this instrument somewhere, you'll also see things where it says maybe DC electric to indicate that it's driven by electricity, not vacuum. It's also common to have, usually around here, a little flag. So when the electric is off, you'll see a red flag that tells you, hey, don't follow this because it's not telling you anything. So when I'm making a standard rate turn, I'm turning it three degrees per second. This is something we use for instrument flying so that we turn at a standard rate, it's a nice shallow turn, so we don't overturn, but this is something you'll use when you start doing instrument training. For VFR pilots, this is mostly something you use, like if you accidentally got into a cloud, or you got into a low visibility situation, and all these other things have failed, this is something to look at. Now the bottom of this doesn't require any power. We've already talked about this before, and that is the ball. It's basically a little bubble level, if you will. And this tells you that you have a coordinated turn or coordinated flight in general. So the rule is very simple. If it's out of the lines, you step on the ball. So when you make a turn, you might see that, hey, I'm turning to the left and the ball is to the left. That means I need to put in some left rudder. So I'm not turning in some weird way like this. I'm turning and I'm hitting the air dead on, right? which is what you want. So that is your turn coordinator. Now, if you're flying a really old plane, it might not actually have a turn coordinator. Instead, it will have something called a turn and bank where you have this little needle and you'll have these little dog houses. And if the needle goes one way or the other, you are probably in a standard rate turn if and only if you have a coordinated turn. And that's called a turn and bank. Now it's not exactly the same thing as a turn coordinator. I don't think Rod really talks about this much, but that's just kind of an FYI. So if you're flying an older aircraft, you might see something that looks more like this. Uh, even our old trainer doesn't have this. It has a turn coordinator in it, um, but that's what that is about. So things to know is that this instrument only reads accurately if you have a coordinated turn. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about from chapter five is glass cockpits. Right. So Rod has a little post-flight briefing about this. Um, here's the biggest thing I wanted to point out. A lot of times people make a big deal about glass cockpits. The reality is it is way easier to transition from a six pack to glass than it is to go the other way around. So. Don't worry about training with this and then transitioning to this. You know, if you're gonna do that, and if you're gonna fly a glass plane, I'd recommend you spend some time on things like the Redbird that we have here in Bloomsburg. They do have a six pack or steam gauge panel for that Redbird. And they also have a Garmin 1000 
glass panel for the Redbird. So you can go back and forth between those two different systems. And that way you can learn how to use this newer system in a way that is a little bit easier, a little bit, I don't, I want, don't want to say less dangerous, but certainly less costly than renting a glass aircraft or even if it's your own aircraft, you know, it costs a lot more money to put fuel in it than it does to rent a simulator for 30 or $35 an hour. So there's that. But the big thing about the glass cockpit is that really, if you look at it, it is sort of the same thing as your six pack. And what do I mean by that? We have this huge attitude indicator. Essentially, the entire display is an attitude indicator. It's right in the middle. There's a little triangle, usually like this, that shows you, you know, where you are at. Are you above the horizon, below the horizon, etc.? And there's also this arc that shows you if you're turning and how much you're banking. So that's kind of like your attitude indicator. Over on the left, we have our airspeed. Well, here we have an airspeed tape. So it's going to tell me, hey, I'm going 75 knots. And then in here, it's also going to have my colored ranges, just like what I would have with a traditional airspeed indicator. If I look over here on the right side, it's going to tell me my altitude. It's going to say you're at, you know, 15, 42, whatever. And once again, it's going to have a tape. And so the tape is going to scroll. Now, depending on the exact system that you're flying, there's usually a vertical speed indication on the side. So it might have a little indicator and it's telling you hey in a few seconds you're going to be at this altitude or some of them will say you're climbing at this rate or descending at this rate it depends on the system again they're all some somewhat a little bit different down at the bottom you essentially have your dg your directional gyro now we didn't talk about it yet but sometimes if you fly an advanced aircraft of having a DG, you have something called an HSI, a Horizontal Situation Indicator, that is a DG with a radio indicator built on top of it, which is essentially what you're going to have down here with your glass cockpit display. Turn coordinator, okay, well this one's a little different. That information is actually displayed usually up here. You'll see there's a little triangle with a little part on the bottom. and this is essentially the ball. This goes one way or the other. You step on it to center it and align everything. And again, you will get indications as to where your heading is going to be after a few seconds, usually down here on the DG. So it's not 100% the same, but it is very similar. You know, airspeed information is over here altitude and climb information is over here where you're going is down at the bottom and the whole stinking thing is one big old attitude indicator normally this stuff is electrically driven so if you're flying an aircraft that has a glass cockpit you might actually have to have two alternators or maybe two batteries and you might even need battery backups on certain instruments and guess what you're also gonna have mechanical gauges as a backup. So all of these aircraft are gonna have an airspeed indicator and an altimeter and maybe a couple of other gauges as well. So that if this all you know, goes down the toilet, you still have something to fly with because you'd be having a really bad day if you lost this. Now, this is a primary flight display. I know it's a really poor picture, but you know, that's why you bought your book for the pretty pictures. Um, and then you also have something called a multifunction display. Typically, it will show things like you know engine parameters, 
or your map, you know, where are you going? That sort of information is shown on the other display. But this PFD, the primary flight display, will show you your navigation instruments, your flight instruments. And that is pretty much chapter five.